Hello and welcome to Self Power Now, where empowering women share their stories and advice about life, work, happiness, love, and success. I'm your host, Debbie Gisoni, and I'm so glad you're here with us today. So sit back and enjoy the show. My guest today is Stella Lupashore, who is on a mission to humanize the workplace and create a more inclusive environment. She's the author of a couple of books, Humanizing Human Capital, Invest in Your People for Optimal Business Returns, and Humans at Work. That sounds very scientific, like a sci-fi novel or something, but it's actually the art and practice of creating the hybrid workplace, which we're all kind of in these days and have been for quite some time. Welcome, Stella. Feel to be here, Debbie, and looking forward to the conversation. Yes, of course. Well, you've had a really interesting life. You've gone from Ukraine to Russia, then the U.S. You're in the U.S., I think, right now. Tell us a little bit about your journey with, you know, going from country to country and your background and what brought you to each of these places. It was always the opportunities that come across uh, uh, in, in your life and then you say yes without really thinking what you're saying yes to and then <laughs> figuring the out time what's going to happen. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, we overthink decisions, right? And lots of times exactly. we, we don't see opportunities when they come our way. So saying yes is very good. So tell us a little bit about that. So originally I was born in Moldova and at that time actually it was Soviet Union. And I was a student at the time when the Soviet Union uh, fell apart and uh, USAID gave money to that region, whole region, to uh, uh, to help countries um, uh, restructure their ways of uh, functioning. I ended up uh, working on a couple of projects that were uh, about setting up the country infrastructure. So there was a, a, a capital markets, uh, a stock exchange, a trading system, a share mm -hmm. register that was set up. Uh, another project that we worked on was on privatizing all the state-owned enterprises. So it was one of those once in a lifetime unique opportunities that was created on the heels of a a complete regime and complete reality destruction um, mm. for us who grew up with the assumption that what we were seeing in the Soviet Union was the reality for us. Mm. And it was one of those first aha moments that not everything is fixed, not everything is permanent. Mm. Things change and things can change in a positive way, can change in a negative way, but what you do and how you perceive the world can either completely crash you because at that time, you know, mm -hmm. everybody lost everything literally overnight mm. or can bring opportunities like the ones that I ended up working uh, and projects I ended up working on that then pulled me into the next and the next and the next. So after Moldova's uh, projects, we got invited to work in Ukraine on similar type of projects with the same company then got invited to move to Moscow to support the practice there. And all of this was one of those, hey, would you da, 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 da. And it's yes. like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have to figure out how do we deal with family? How do we deal with kids as they were being born along the way? How do we deal with family who is left behind aging parents? So we had to deal with all of that. And on one side, it's much more complex to to solve for that when you don't have the family around you to support you as yes. your family grows on the flip side it gives you that perspective and distance and appreciation for the opportunities we can give to our children going forward so um it's a trade-off that i'm sure many people especially if they have to leave their home country had to uh, to make but as a result of that, I think we've managed to live through so many regime changes, through so many uh, cultural uh, contexts and so many uh, practices and ways of uh, of functioning as a citizen that for us, it's, it's we become citizen of the world. Yes. Uh, there's no really uh, 
a country that you necessarily belong to. Yeah. And I love speaking to people like you who have come from different countries and have been around because we're so insulated sometimes here in the U.S., um, and with our own culture. And I, I come from immigrant parents. So I, I understand, you know, coming from another country and the importance of just integrating culture. And also, as you said, you know, looking at opportunity, even if you're in the worst possible situation in your life, looking at what is being presented to me by the universe, what is in front of me that could lead to something more positive than the situation I'm in now. And yes, you're sometimes you have to give up some things, right? You have to give up some things, but you have to kind of, well, what's the risk versus the return? And also look at the long-term effects for your own children and their health and their happiness as well. What eventually brought you to the U S it was one of those, uh, um, we were at that time in Moscow, uh, the whole office was going uh, after uh, one particular client and there was a, um, a kind of preliminary decision that uh, there will be a specific technology that will be implemented. So the whole office was sent to learn that technology here in the US. Mm -hmm. During that time, and by the way, I don't come from an HR background because right now that's kind of my, my professional specialty. I was a math and computer science. I was doing technical work. I was in IT department <laughs> <laughs> predominantly. And I was being sent to learn HR module of that technology because I'm a woman, I'm a girl. So you can go learn. <laughs> they HR. just put you into the <laughs> HR, the soft skills, or they used to call them, soft you know, the, the people <laughs> skills, which by the way, now companies are recognizing are probably the most important skills to have in terms of success of your people and your company. So they're just as exactly. important as the technical skills. Yeah. I, re I remember reading your bio, you came from that math and science. So you came here with um, learning a technology and you ended up staying is that what happened i ended up building a great network during the training they the uh organizers said look we need hr it's a very new functionality we need some people who can help build the program help deliver anybody interested sure <laughs> <laughs> and by the way um I have a husband who may be interested too. So <laughs> all of this in background, what this required is to figure out what to do with our one-year-old. And we made the very deliberate choice to send her back to stay with grandparents while we were uh, here in the U.S. just because we knew we wouldn't be good parents and be able to balance both the work and, and childcare. Um, and during that time, my husband applied to school and he got accepted. So <laughs> the only thing we had to do is go back to Moscow, design, and join the for me to to tap into my partner uh, partnerships and relationships I build and say, hey, anybody need needs an employee, <laughs> and, and for him to go back to school. So it was kind of a in the middle of it. I'm sure it, it felt really painful, uh, but it was all this kind of. Uh, uh, rationalization in my head going on saying yes I'm gonna miss a lot of my time was my one-year-old at that time but mm -hmm. on the flip side I'll catch up with other children maybe <laughs> in the future <laughs> when I have them so, because they're not gonna remember anyway yeah when, <laughs> when did your young. child get to join you two and a half years later oh <gasps> wow wow were you able to visit was, during that time yes yeah yes. Oh, was wonderful but it was really heartbreaking to finally bring her over and meet her at the airport and then for her not to recognize just because she was recognizing just the face on the uh um on the computer oh we my goodness <laughs> oh my goodness wow wow and how old is she now she is now 27 and oh. she's a brilliant brilliant uh young lady she uh and, and we had these conversations uh how deprived did you feel and obviously she didn't because she had a really really loving uh environment yes. and yes. she was she had everything 
and more probably than we could give. Uh, yes. If we were in, for, in terms of time, right? Of, time and energy focused. Yeah. And that's all kids need is love around them. Yeah. yeah it's, oh, that's yeah. amazing. What an amazing story. <laughs> and where did you settle in the U.S.? What, what city? Settling is a, is a tricky word. <laughs> My uh, belongings were in Boston, and we we had, of course, an, a place. But then we moved to live on campus while my husband was studying. I was on the road. I was on the plane traveling to different projects. Yeah. So that was another consideration why it was mm -hmm. really difficult to raise a child if you're never there. Even after we brought her to U.S. to be with us, um, you know, I continued to travel until I had to make a decision because she was crying on my suitcases every Sunday night. Oh. And it just, you get to that point where you say, okay, it's time to make some sort of a different choice. Like I've abandoned you yeah, enough, maybe yeah. it's time to. <laughs> I've even had that experience with, with puppies, with dogs, believe it or not. I used to travel a lot when I was in high tech in corporate. And I remember getting my suitcase out on my bed and opening it up. And one of my dogs uh, would, always jump in it he would jump in it yeah. and i'd be like oh they know. i don't want to leave it. i know it's just heartbreaking it's heartbreaking so you you started this project um coming from that math and science arena and you started this project in human resources or you looked at this module and that sort of gave you the interest then to start working in in more of an hr people oriented capacity to me, it was mostly as a as a the whole world opened up when I got exposed to HR, and it mm -hmm. wasn't a, a, a it was quite a steep curve because when you come from an environment where HR is predominantly just you know payroll and you know a few basic things, and you come mm -hmm. to United States where you have to learn what are all of these complex benefits plans that you have to deal with, and how you measure time, and how you pay overtime, and how you define what work is how do you think about all the development programs it became kind of one of those whoa mm -hmm. <laughs> but on the flip side I could relate to every single thing because I could see how this gives an opportunity not only to technology but to me personally to influence the experience of people in a positive way mm -hmm. um, you can change how uh, processes work. You can change how technology, underlying technology supports those processes. You can change the communication, the, um, the offerings and the programs as an HR practitioner, and all of that impacts people at work. Right. Which so, impacts the, the companies. Exactly. Yes. And the names of the book, both of them have humans because we need to think of humans first at work not just resources, human resources or human assets or human capital or whatever other terms that are dehumanizing to some degree right. that we're describing workers. Right. Um, we're humans, we have needs, we have circumstances, we have life uh, situations, we have health conditions. All of that forms the unique, beautiful um, individuals that we are. And the more we can take into account all of those differences and uniqueness and personalize uh, how we feel at work and what we do at work, the better and more productive and more uh, loyal we can be to the company to deliver on its goals. Yeah, I think uh, what you said, how you feel at work is is really important. You know, wellness has become such a huge area in the corporate workplace. And I've always been in the wellness field now for 25 years. And I will say, you know, back in the day, no one talked about wellness programs. I mean, the, the programs were just, you know, what are the health benefits and payroll, as you said, you know, it was pretty yeah, cut yeah. and dry medical benefits, payroll, that's it. And things like meditation and stress release and, and mental, um, mental illness uh, programs, none of those were discussed. And now it seems like it's all over the top, especially since the pandemic, you know, a couple of years ago, and all the hybrid work situation. So when you say humanizing the workplace, you're talking about really looking at people as 
people that are not, mach- yes. they're not machines. They're not, you know, employee number X, Y, Z or whatever. It's an actual person with a, um, a family or a pet or, you know, Absolutely. ups and downs in their lives and understanding that when years ago, no one really brought their, their work into, into the corporate. I, I was going through a very tough time in my family when I was in corporate, uh, going, doing, uh, with illness and tragedy and deaths. And I never brought that into the office because nobody wanted to hear about that first of all. And I don't know that I could have handled it in the kind of workplace and the kind of position that I had. And I've always said that, um, you know, people above profits are important. So what are some of the things that you are, so do you consult with companies now and, and let them know, you know, what are some of the things they can do to humanize their workplace and what, what are they, you know, whether it's a small company or large. Absolutely. It is really helping them think about individuals at work through the same lens that companies have looked at their consumers and by eliminating friction or creating better experience for consumers, they were able to grow the revenue, become you know, market leaders, mm. capture complete niche. Think about us as employees when we have no idea what a good experience looks like. How can we deliver that to the, to the customers, mm. right? We come to work, we get up in the morning, we um, get jolted out of the bed because, <laughs> you know, we have a long commute time ahead of us. We come, get stuck in traffic, uh, come to the building, realize that we forgot our badge. Nobody believes us. By the time we get up to the <laughs> office where we need to be, you're already half an hour late. You And open stressed your out and very stressed out. <laughs> your laptop doesn't boot up or you forgot your password. By the time you have to reset it, 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 you know, you're exasperated and you start working and somebody interrupts you. So all of these experiences that is we call collectively work is not designed around us doing our best work at the time one works for us, right? Because we may be more alert in the morning or we may need a little bit of a uh, social time and break in the afternoon we need to get up every 90 minutes uh, just so we can stretch our legs and get the blood flowing all of those things are not taken into consideration the assumption is you will have your device it will be the cheapest probably not mm-hmm. updated probably um, it will be something that you will be expected to figure out how to navigate all the complexity of working here, be that you have multiple systems that may not be uh, integrated, or maybe the data is not as, uh, data exchange between the, them is not as robust, or maybe just purely was designed by engineers for engineers, which means the assumption is you know a lot more <laughs> on how to use this technology. Oh, I've been when in that fact- situation myself where, <laughs> you know, I've started, you know, either a contract job with someone and they're like, yeah. okay, this is, you know, and they've got about 12 different SAS, you know, pl- platforms, you know, to learn. Yeah. And you're like, who the heck is going to, first of all, yeah. you don't have the time you're doing your job. So you don't have the time to learn them. And it might be something totally new. And then it's so stressful because you're working in an environment you don't really understand. So what can, what can employers do then to mitigate some of these issues? One technique, and of course, there are different schools that teach these principles, but human centricity. So human centric design is really the, the, one of the tools in the portfolio that can help address uh, some of these issues. Mm -hmm. So when we think about these devices, right, Mm -hmm. how much upskilling have we, have we gone through in order to be able to use it? Mm -hmm. We picked it up and relatively quickly, we figure out the design system that Mm -hmm. is behind. If you, you know, scroll up left, right, there are certain behavior that you'll expect from the, on your phone right exactly on a phone if you uh you know there are a lot of behaviors that kind of become ingrained and then they get built into every uh every interaction you have and upskilling is very gradual and very easy because it's designed for users Mm -hmm. and it's been tested in a way 
to minimize any friction and any barriers for the users to be able to utilize it. So all of this requires not only co-creating and collaborating with the end users to uh, figure out what makes sense the most, but mm -hmm. then once you build, have that feedback loop that allows you to tweak mm -hmm. as people encounter new issues that you may not have thought before. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the workplace experience, similar type of principles can be applied. Mm -hmm. People are not going to, um, you know, maybe quit because you don't have a great uh, HR management system. They're going to quit because their Wi-Fi is not uh, strong or maybe they, you know, little things that are irritants that over time build into one big annoying mm -hmm. thing that something mm -hmm. else, you know, makes the last strong. Then you say, I'm out of here. I'm tired right. of fighting this. Right. What about so, feeling supported in that, in kind of the wellness oh, yeah. area as well? I mean, that's especially yeah. with a lot of the hybrid workplaces that have now emerged. And I know you're an expert at that too, is um, how, how can companies help employees both in the hybrid workspace and also in the wellness arena to, to feel more empowered and to feel good about themselves and their jobs? Absolutely. I love the, the silver lining, this silver lining of pandemic, as much tragedy that brought, I think it opened up the conversations around mental health. It lowered the stigma around it mm -hmm. and that's why we are able now to put in place wellness programs and really be more mindful about mental health because it does exist and it can affect us at different stages in our life it can be triggered by different things and it's not that we um weren't dealing with those problems they were just so hidden and not talked about as you mentioned earlier in mm -hmm. the work environment and now that the work environment is kind of very blurry home <laughs> versus work versus mm -hmm. coffee shop versus we work we have to integrate and bring those into the forefront what i think i've seen gradually happen is a lot more that the this the traits and leadership style that has changed over the pandemic. I think leaders became more real and they started themselves sharing uh, how their own mental health uh, has been impacted. And that growing level of empathy that we started seeing, people mm -hmm. finally look how real the issues are and they realize that if they're not gonna address, their role as the leader is being impacted, the organization, as ability to have the talent needed to perform is going to be impacted. So um, when it comes to well-being and wellness, of course, you see a variety of, of uh, offerings. There is benefits programs. There is uh, employee assistance programs that are being offered. So more than a, a clinical and mental health uh, um, kind of remediation issues, all the way to look, Maybe you don't have any mental issues, but you really need a break because you're stressed. You have some you need other coping skills. Anxiety. Yeah, exactly. You need coping skills. Yeah, yeah. So you can learn how to do that. You can find a peer support group. You can have exercise, mm -hmm. uh, access to different, uh, you know, whatever it is that helps you manage the stress level. Um, but also, I think there is increased recognition that we have so many devices we have so many notifications all of those interruptions also cause anxiety and it's this underlying low level of anxiety that mm -hmm. keeps snagging at you that eventually mm -hmm. also becomes a, a big problem so some individuals try to do that in some cases the technology can help you manage some of those notifications and put yourself on do not disturb so you can have focused time over because it takes a few seconds for us to regroup and refocus once we get a, a, a notification and an interruption mm -hmm, in our mm -hmm. workflow. So the the less of that interaction we have, the less time we'll need to refocus and finish what we need to focus. So there are different ways to bring a little bit more calmness and um, centeredness mm -hmm. and groundedness uh, to, to how we perform. But one thing that I think 
we need to keep in mind there's only so much organizations can do and employers can do we play just as an important role to speak up when we need the break to ask for certain accommodations when we need them to give ourselves a break and not you know work till the wee hours just because we needed to take a, a time during the lunch to go to the doctor whatever it is exactly. so it's a, i think it's a two-way street and conversation that has to happen. yeah absolutely and i'm glad you mentioned the variety of of wellness um maybe needs that people have because there is a wide spectrum and I believe some in the past companies have, you know, they've offered like one program, whether that's fitness yeah. or nutrition or whatever, and not realizing that, as you said, the user experience is all different, right? And if that user does not show up and say, this is what my need is, then we don't know if this is a person who may um, maybe prefers to learn just on a digital tool on his own and uh, his, or their own and only have, you know, some wants some skills with learning meditation or coping skills or stress or, you know, health or whatever, but wants to just be on their own learning versus someone who wants more mental um, illness, you know, one-to-one -one coaching from a professional psychologist or psychiatrist or something. That's a huge spectrum, right, of needs that large companies have to address now. It's not one size fits all anymore. I recently, during COVID, I wrote uh, four programs, uh, four courses, so to speak, for uh, for wellness and they're on the side of that, the, the early start side of that spectrum, where it's just people who can actually go through courses on their own, take them easy, you know, they're easy to take, easy to interact, that sort of thing. And they don't need, you know, a personal coach or something like that. I call them the self power now courses, and those are available to corporations, but you're right. Um, it, it does take, um, the user, the user, the, the, the employee in this case, you know, whether you're in a small company or a large company, it doesn't really matter to step up and say, this is what I need. Or also to step up and say, um, I just lost my mother, you know, or whatever, whatever that crisis is that you're going through. And for the manager to put themselves in that, in their shoes and say, okay, if that were me, you know, what would I want? What would I need? Well, maybe I need time off, maybe, you know, and again, to, as you said, to humanize and, and think about, okay, if that were me, what, what would I want from the organization? Yeah. Right, right. It's so interesting in the work environment and many conversations I have with students that I teach or practitioners in general, we talk about me versus the employer. And we think about the employer as this big blob <laughs> that can have a name or it can have a gender or it's kind of, it's, it's a they, them, but it's, it's somewhat, you know, uh, anthropomorphized um, when in fact, we're all members of this employer ecosystem. And it's a system that makes decisions right based made on of people a system function. made of people exactly. yeah <laughs> and, and we all have opportunity to influence things was on our control and our kind of purview and then for everything else we just need to figure out ways to partner or figure out who is the uh, the best partner to help you solve certain problems so the more we can take the power in our hands and say what is it that i can control and influence and mm -hmm. speak up and demand and uh, disconnect, whatever it is, and then versus where I need support that mm -hmm. the company can provide in general mm -hmm. and who may be able to help me out. What are some of the things people uh, in our audience might be you know, looking for jobs? What are some of the red flags or things that they should be looking at when looking at corporations or questions they should ask? Oh, it's such a complex and loaded question <laughs> <laughs> go ahead <laughs> and, and i i will try to ramble a little through the the response so when we think about the current environment right we have record low unemployment we have record high inflation we have companies on one side laying off and it becomes contagious because there is a lot it started with technology companies and now it's moving into um 
more mature industries. Um, you have people who are leaving, people who are uh, completely leaving the companies and not looking for any other jobs. So they just take breaks and became, becomes mm -hmm. a lot safer to have a gap in your career and your resume. So there are a lot of norms that we knew about employment before pandemic, BC, before COVID. Yes. <laughs> have been have really been flipped on a head and where this may go on one side i think companies are finally realizing that you cannot mistreat people and you really need to give them a good good experience because not only that will impact your performance but it will also impact your reputation as an employer right so companies do care about that because social media completely changed that relationship but also i think people themselves realize that work is not and shouldn't be everything about their identity, right? Mm -hmm. You can have extracurricular activities and interests outside of your work. You do not need to kill yourself for an income. And there are other ways that a lot of these new technologies are opening up opportunities for people to earn an income but not necessarily be committed to um, a traditional employment relationship so i think we see a, a, an interesting spectrum kind of a divergence it's no longer just hey i'm going to be a regular employee or i'm going to be a contractor we now have creators we have a builders economy we have contributors economy for these web three companies that operate in a very new and different uh, environment without necessarily being tethered to a, an employer, mm -hmm. but nevertheless earning an income, having uh, the ability to grow skills, belonging to a community. So getting the same things that you get out of the employment relationship without necessarily, you know, almost like you, you, you're not committing <laughs> mm -hmm. permanently in traditional sense. When it comes to things to watch out, Obviously, when you're looking for a job, you really need to think about what is it that you want to do the job after next. And mm -hmm. then that will inform what you can get the most out of you this next job. Because you really are there not only to give your talent, but to get something in exchange. And pay attention to all of these little moments that matter along the journey of uh, pursuing the job. Because how you get treated during the recruitment process, most likely if you see people not showing up for interviews or somebody not responding to your emails, the same type of experience will be once you join the company. Mm -hmm. So be really mindful about some of these early indicators and, and signs that it may not be necessarily the company that you'll, you'll be um, thriving. The other thing, of course, is to really be introspective and, and think about what is it that you want to go to work for because when you're young and you're looking maybe for your skills development and getting that eminence in the and recognition in the industry you may make very different decisions than when you are winding down your career you just want flexibility you want to give back you want to support and mentor others and Every company has its strength and uh, the environment for the life stage that you're looking for at the moment. So sometimes you want to uh, quickly progress in your career. So maybe a smaller company that really is uh, scaling up will give you that really accelerated growth. Whereas uh, when you start having children, maybe you want stability. Therefore, you will choose very different type of destination for yourself where you'll get that stability. Maybe you'll not have the high rewards as high rewards, as a <laughs> high growth environment. And then um, I think increasingly it's an opportunity for organizations also, also to start looking at the segment of workforce over 45 and older. When we think from trajectory, as especially as women, right? Mm. We make different choices. We pivot a lot more because we tend to have children. We tend to say no to promotions just because we have to support our spouse career. So there are a lot of pivots and changes and our resume looks a lot more 
patterned mm -hmm. than straight one lane. And that actually uh, is not always helpful, especially for jobs where people want to see, hey, you've always been a mm -hmm. CEO material and you've been growing toward that destination. And it impacts women in a disproportionate way. Um, it will, if we step out of the labor force, it will be uh, a lot more difficult for us to re-enter, number one. Number two, uh, the compensation level most likely is not going to be the same uh, that we had before. So mm -hmm. the, the slope of that uh, uh, income growth is going to be lower. And as a result, the social security will be smaller. As a result, the savings probably will be eroded much earlier mm -hmm. and we will live longer than our partners. So it's a it's an opportunity for organizations to say, hey, typically when we look at uh, somebody over 45, if they didn't make it, most likely they're not going to make it. Therefore, we're not going to invest in them. We're not going to retain them. But this is a talent pool that has experience, has wisdom, mm. has stability, has seen it all and can contribute in a much more impactful way so it's not just the cost that needs to be examined but the value they bring to the work environment so to me this segment of workers and the just in general the ageism that we see in the work environment it's it's a it's probably one of the last isms that we as a society mm. attempted to address and i agree it's ahead of us two yeah two things stand out from what you're saying one is um both from the employer and the employee point of view is not to look at just traditional boxes. So from the employee point of view, not to think about, it's just gotta be a W2 job, you know, nine to five kind of thing that there are so many different options available yeah. if you're willing to look for them and willing to ask for them, right? Because sometimes, you know, the employer doesn't even know that they could do something a different way. And from the employer's point of view, to look at people in uh, not as boxes as well, like, okay, they're over 45, so they're done with their career. They can't, you know, I can't use them or they're too young or they've got to work in this type of environment or it's got to be this type of job. So, and, and you're right. I think COVID opened up a lot of different possibilities because I know people that worked in companies that could never work from home before because they weren't trusted, so to speak, to work at home. And still many, you know, many managers feel that way. And yet projects got done, meetings got were on time, uh, people were happy, they collaborated online, there were team building exercises online. You know, there are ways to pivot and make things work that are not traditional. And I do love that you talk about, uh, especially women over 45, who have maybe taken a pause from their career and want to get back in. I think from the individual's point of view, it's difficult to say, well, I, I used to earn this, right, as a director or CFO or whatever that position is. But now, I you know, I don't want that kind of responsibility anymore, but I still want to work and maybe yep. accept something a little bit lower um, or a completely different job. And it it kind of, you know, it 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 infringes on, you know, a little bit of your pride as well. Uh, right. <laughs> and your it's feeling of, also, of net worth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also priorities shift as you get older, right? That mm -hmm. status may not matter anymore to you. And many times you may uh, take in kind compensation, right? You say, look, I get the flexibility. That's more important for me than that, you know, corner office or that title or yes. whatever. No other uh, compensation comes with it, so it's a it's it's a readjustment as we progress through lifetime. But mm -hmm. HR process is not necessarily uh, keeping up with that adjustment, especially as we our longevity grows and our uh, lifespan and our ability to be productive longer uh, uh, yes. expands. Um, yes, yes, and the hybrid workplace has has really changed everything. Do you think that most companies are going to continue allowing that hybrid workplace or has have most of them gone back to requiring employees to come in it's a big spectrum i think some companies have realized how cheap it is not to have an office mm. and even if you do have an office for people to come 
for the purposes of socializing and not necessarily working. Because let's face it, many of us, you know, schlep those two hours into an office only to be on Zoom calls all day long. So yes, what's was the yeah. value in coming. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to having very intentional, um, deliberate decision behind what are you hiring office to do? Right. right? So that's is, an interesting concept that, you know, I'm laughing because I'm thinking, okay, so work from home and party in the office. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. And because the, this, that social interaction is the missing piece, yeah. right? <laughs> when you work from the home. Social interaction is building trust, is, is observing. I think the, the segment that will uh, really negatively be impacted by hybrid and remote work is really early in their career employees because mm -hmm. they many things they learn by observing, right? So there are right. a lot of tacit skills that you're acquiring right. early on on how you show up for work, how you communicate with others, right, how you interact. Right. All, all of those things are important to have others yes, <laughs> in the yes. office to showcase and coach them and teach. So from that perspective, I think it's important to have a physical presence. But again, it doesn't have to be every day. It doesn't have right. to be five days a week. And a lot of companies are either completely giving up their physical space or they have a space uh, that people who travel or people who want or choose to come, they can right. come. And then very intentionally periodic scheduling of everyone coming together to do mm -hmm. social activities or team building, et cetera. Yeah. And then you have the other spectrum where it's, you know, come five days a week. And a lot of uh, individuals who have adopted or moved or changed their lifestyles mm -hmm. are choosing different organizations to go to because they may no longer be willing exactly. to make the sacrifices. It's before. so important to be able to give employees that choice if the job is appropriate for that. Of course, you know some some jobs are not. You have to be on site. But it's it's so important for that. Um, so what what do you do? What what does your daily day look like? Are you working with lots of different clients? Are you uh, creating more program? What what are you doing on a daily basis? Uh, it's a mix on one of the following activities. Uh, there is teaching that I do. So I teach different. Um, I teach a class at NYU uh, on digital workplace design. So helping the mm -hmm. next generation of HR leaders mm -hmm. think differently about the workplace experience. I work on projects that predominantly are at the intersection of technology, mm -hmm. analytics, and mm -hmm. human design, human-centered mm -hmm. design. So uh, they, the project itself could be called, I don't know, employee experience or analytics transformation, but they all have a technology component. They all have an analytics component and they all have a, let's look at the journey and figure out how we can improve it and put mm -hmm. in place technology to make it better or mm -hmm. find ways to measure it so we know whether or not we're successful. So those are the kind of the the the, the projects I get involved with. And then... You know, speaking to amazing people, uh, we recently recorded the podcast with uh, two of our friends about emerging world of work in the context of Web3. Mm -hmm. So I know this is, sounds like a bunch of... Uh, Techno mumbo jumbo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but I'm curious, I'm learning about the world as it evolves from my children. Mm. So my oldest one that... Uh, the abandoned <laughs> one. <laughs> She's now building conversational AI. She's building chatbots at a company. That's her job. So she was a nerdy, bookish girl who wanted to have a career in English language. I don't know, writing, reading, uh -huh. whatever. And she's now teaching technology how to mm. speak mm. in a way. Um, so she's applying linguistics and, and kind of how we as humans converse and applying that to uh to chatbots my middle one was uh aspiring to be a jazz trumpet player mm -hmm. and he even pursued a music degree and halfway through pandemic he said look i jazz trumpet classes on zoom is just not a good <laughs> college investment <laughs> yeah not a good way to to uh, put money behind that so he completely 
dropped out of the the educational pursuit and got involved with uh several DAOs. It's it's a distributed autonomous organization, decentralized autonomous organization, which is nothing more than a bunch of people who have a passion for solving a specific problem who come together and they have a way to democratically vote on all the decisions this group makes around mm. specific projects. And they have a way to um, remunerate and pay. So in, in a way you, you you work for a quasi company, but there's no traditional corporate backing behind Structure, it. Right. So he works on some projects that are just incredible. Um, the the DAO that he's involved with predominantly is called Juicebox. So mm. I don't know if you remember a couple of uh, I think it was late last year there was a, a um, auction to uh, to sell a copy the seventeenth copy of the Constitution of the U.S. Constitution, mm. and there was one of these DAOs that got formed called Constitution DAO to bid. So they crowdfunded money. They crowdfunded, I think, $44 million to go mm. bid and own the copy of the Constitution. Mm. And then, of course, Citadel came in and outbid them last minute because <laughs> everything they do, all the transactions are publicly publicly available. It's transparent. Uh, anyone can see everything you have done and uh, the, uh, all the transactions you made and the money that came in and came out. So what a nice I way to listen- to have business out in the world, right? But it's it's a very different way of doing the work. Mm. So to me, when I have conversations with him, is I always try to think, well, what does that mean to the HR profession or to the workplace in general? How corporations need to think about how they structure the practices, mm-hmm. how I should prepare my skills to be able to survive <laughs> in that future. Because there are a lot of positives. Yes, it's not for everyone. It's uh, Uh, it's not insecure it's going to take a long time to mature you'll have the same problems with diversity and inclusion because predominantly uh male participants are are attracted Mm. to that type of environment but it is an emerging model that i think it's a fascinating to just get curious about and learn more and then think Mm. is there something that i can Mm. take advantage and be an early adopter of yeah so Anyway, I, I love I, your, I, I love your curiosity and your, your openness, your openness. And, and that's what got you to where you are now. And we should all have a little bit of that in every single day. Exactly. 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 I well, hope thank you. people. Oh, go ahead. No? Oh, go ahead. Can cut this part. <laughs> thank you so much for your time today, Stella and your presence here with us listeners. You can find links to connect with Stella or to get free gifts on my site, selfpowernow.com. I wish you all a wonderful day and come back and join us sometime. Thanks for listening to Self Power Now. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with others. Follow it on your favorite podcast platform and join our community on selfpowernow.com and receive three free happiness gifts. And while you're there, if you're looking for more ways to be happy, healthy, peaceful, and loved, check out my books and new online courses. Until next time, this is Debbie Jasoni wishing you self-power now.